um, so just wanted to welcome everybody to this morning's Orchard webinar. Um, special welcome to Trevor for giving up his time this morning to help us uh, talk about retirement, which is something that most people don't really want to think about or do anything about. But hopefully after today, we'll, we'll feel a little bit differently. So yeah, over to you, Trevor. Just if anyone's got questions, I think just to put them in the chat box and we'll address them at the end. Um, so Trevor, thank you and over to you. Great, good morning, everybody. And thanks for having me. Good to chat to you all. Uh, it is going to be quite informal, I think this morning. And uh, I have got some slides that I'm going to go through. So my suggestion probably is let me just go through the slides and hopefully cover most of the bases and then we can open it up, of course, to any questions, etc. So I'm going to share my screen and then we can get going. Is it all, is it showing on your guys' screen? Retire and invest with peace of mind? Okay, great. All right. So um, what we're really discussing today is, I guess, three areas that I'm going to cover. The first is a little bit about retiring and what one's goals are in terms of retirement. Then I'm going to talk about how do you go and actually invest into the market and the types of assets that you can invest into. And then I'm going to just give you a brief introduction into unit trust funds and the different types of funds that there are so that you have a, a, a broad understanding of that. So hopefully, um, I'm guessing many of you may have already financial advisors or not. But hopefully at the end of this, you can ask your financial advisor perhaps the right questions. What you don't want to do is be like this person in the, in the slide, I guess, who is 65 years old and it's in his final week of work and he goes to see his financial advisor and really tries to expect magic from his financial advisor. And sadly, and you cannot have magic in terms of saving for retirement. Uh, you have to start it early. And certainly if you leave it to the last moment, it's going to materially uh, affect you. So I think some of the, a, a good part to start off is really asking yourself some questions and understanding your, your relationship with money and, and how you deal with money. So there's no right and wrong answers to these questions, but perhaps it's something at some stage that you can have a conversation with yourself really and ask yourself, does money make you anxious? Dealing with money and, and there are so many aspects to that in terms of just day to day paying your bills, going down to the shop versus the more larger type of financial questions. When you buy a car, does it make you anxious? Which car should you buy? How much should you spend on a car? Uh, do you lie at, awake at night worrying about your retirement? Um, do you see often many of your friends, perhaps that are older and reaching retirement and suddenly they're having to adapt their lifestyle or they can't afford to go out as much as they used to, or they're struggling to pay their rates and electrical bills. Um, also importantly, you'll see when it comes to saving is the importance of sticking to a plan. So again, if you are somebody that is good to sticking with sticking to a plan that is consistent, that's great. If you're somebody who chops and changes, often changes their mind, um, not great for, for investing. I, I mentioned earlier about speaking to a financial advisor. 
And I think many people make the mistake of thinking that they know better. Uh, they People always think they the, the expert at what shares are going to go up, what unit trusts are the best unit trusts, is the market going to go up or down, as opposed to perhaps leaving it to the, area, the, the specialists in those fields uh, and seeking actually expert or professional advice in terms of how to go about saving and investing. You need to understand what your goals are, your wants and desires. So different people have different things that are important to them. Some people play when they retire or even pre-retirement want to be traveling once a year, twice a year, three years overseas. Some people want to live in a fancy house. Others are happy with a smaller house. Some people want to send their kids overseas to study. Other people are happy for their kids to study locally. So again, depending on what your own goals are for yourself, for your family, for your own inner happiness can affect how much ultimately you're going to need at retirement. And importantly on the next one is whatever your goals and desires are, is of course you need to be realistic with them. It's no point in wishing, you know, you were um, a multi-billionaire and living a really fancy lifestyle if that's not even a realistic expectation. <clears throat> and then I think very importantly, and we're going to talk a little bit about it, is also how do you value your own time and skill? So, of course, how do you save for retirement is by earning an income. And how do you earn an income is from whatever skill it is that you have. And I know we've got accountants on the line and uh, uh, coaches and everybody else. Everybody's got their own skill. And what research actually shows is in the majority of cases, people very, very often undervalue themselves and they underprice themselves. So it's very important to, to know what your skill is, what value you're adding to other people and society, and importantly, to price yourself accordingly and charge your professional fees at the appropriate rate. Two critical concepts just to start off with, which we're going to talk about. The first, uh, and, and this really affects saving for retirement, investing. The first is that your money, you need to grow your money at least equally, but ideally faster than inflation. Otherwise, you're actually going to be getting poorer each year. So one rand today is not worth one rand next year. So currently in South Africa, inflation is sitting at about 4% per annum. So something that costs one rand in the shop today, if inflation is 4%, means that it's going to cost one rand and four cents next year. In other words, 4% more. So if the money that you currently have is does not grow by at least 4% over the course of the next year, you've actually becoming poorer because the buying power of your money cannot keep up with the costs of rising prices. So the first really rule of when you're going to invest your money is that you need your money to grow at least equal to inflation. And actually you want it to grow faster than inflation so that you, you become wealthier as opposed to just keeping up with price increases. The second very important concept is what we call the power of compounding. And the power of compounding is that you get growth on your money as it grows. So I've just put a very simple example there. In year one, if you have 100 Rand and the market goes up by 10% and your money grows by 10%, your 100 Rand goes to 110 Rand. So you've made 10%, 10 Rand growth in your money. Now you would think if the market goes up then 10% again the next year that you're gonna make, okay, another 10 Rand, but no, you don't. You make actually 10% now on your 110 Rand because what you need to do is reinvest the 10 Rand that you made in the previous year. You're now starting at 110 Rand. And so 10% on 110 
grows to 121. So you actually make 11 rand in terms of the growth of your money. So each year you can see your 10, although your growth is 10%, which is constant, the amount that your money is growing is actually growing faster because you're getting growth on the growth. So this effect, which we call compounding, is a massive over a long period of time and makes a really, really big difference. And I'll show you an example of that. So saving for retirement, how much is enough? In terms of one's retirement journey, this is really uh, put in a, in a graphic what, what your, your life stage looks like, starting at when you're born all the way to ultimately really when you die. So you'll see there when the yellow line sort of falls and is when you start working until you really start working and or studying, you've got your parents are hopefully covering your costs, et cetera. Then suddenly you start incurring debts. And those debts would be things like um, buying a house, paying for your education, uh, rent, savings, et cetera. And over time, until you hit retirement age, you spend your life basically paying off your debts. At the same time that you are paying off your debts, you are hopefully saving. A portion of your salary every month you put away. Um, and so your savings are also growing over the course of your working career. So from when you start working at commitment age and you're retired retirement age, you start off with your debts over, over your lifespan, you pay your debts off, you are increasing your savings for retirement, and then any money that you may have over and above that, we just call that for wealth, that's additional wealth creation, and that's a bit like the cherry on the top. So this is really the profile of debts versus savings for retirement versus additional wealth creation over and above it, and for your average person, what it looks like over their lifespan. So if we take those different color bars and, and just break it down a little bit, we see on the debt side, what are we talking about in terms of debt? So that's things, as I've mentioned, like your study loan, motor vehicle finance, paying off your home. And how do we protect against that as general society? is we often take out insurance for that. So that's taking out insurance. If your house burns down or gets damaged, that you can at least protect yourself in terms of um, getting paid out for your main assets that you're trying to build up. Motor vehicles, we also insure if we have a, a, a car accident. In terms of savings, and remember, when we're talking about savings, you'll see that we talk about short to medium term liabilities and long term liabilities. So these are liabilities in the sense of you need to save for future costs that you are going to have. And that's why we use the word liabilities. So in the shorter term, you need to save to pay for your children's education. In the longer term, you need to save to pay for your retirement in those years when you're actually not earning an income. And how do we again protect ourselves against that? We take out things like death and disability cover. You may have had your insurance broker come to you and say, okay, if you get knocked over by a car, uh, you need to have disability cover because you can't work anymore and this will cover your monthly salary until you hit retirement age, et cetera. Then we have our wealth creation. And this is that cherry on the top. This is about really building additional wealth. And there it's often about taking your money, uh, investing into the stock market, into shares, into whatever it might be. Some people invest into art, for example, things like that. And you invest both within your country, within South Africa, the South African stock market, as well as taking perhaps money offshore by your offshore allowance. Your risk there is, of course, the markets and market cycles. Markets go up and down, and we try and protect against that through diversification. And then the last side is where we're drawing an income. And again, there we're talking about taking out your traditional 
insurance type product uh, uh, products that can provide you with with ongoing capital. So <clears throat> your most valuable asset is your ability to earn an income. Uh, we, what we've done here is just over a typical working career, starting let's say at 25 years old when you finish studying until retiring and different people retire of course at different ages, but traditionally people retire say at 65 and you have about a 40 year working lifespan. Assuming you're earning a monthly salary, you have about 492 salaries to save for retirement, which isn't that much if you actually think about it. So let's call it you've got 500 monthly opportunities to put money aside over your entire life to save ultimately for your retirement, which let's call it is from age 65 to 85. And in today's world, people are living longer as medical uh, some, uh, medical advances are pe keeping people alive longer. So 20 years is probably a conservative uh, estimate for, for how long people are living. So your money that you're saving needs to then last for about 240 additional months. So that's really just putting it into perspective, the type of timeframes and the amount of monthly savings that you can do. And, but in terms of every month, we've got to cover, of course, lots and lots of expenses. We need to save a portion of our monthly salary for retirement. We need to pay our rent or our bond on a house. We need to pay for our food. We've got to pay our car installments. We've got to travel if we want to do the odd holidays. We've got other bills, uh, whatever it might be, for all various different types of things. And of course, we've got to pay for both short-term and long-term insur insurance, which is what I spoke about earlier, things like your house insurance, car insurance, disability cover, et cetera. So it's quite a lot that one needs to be budgeting for every month. And very broadly speaking, it's about finding a balance throughout your life cycle. So I, I think really you can split it probably into three main areas. The first area is that you want to have, and COVID was a very, very good example of this, is what we call just a, a rainy day fund. So again, as a rule of thumb, we're talking probably about three months worth of income, at least sometimes up to six months. And this might be for people, for example, who suddenly get retrenched, who suddenly uh, were, were, put, were put, um, put on furlough during COVID and you know, had to go and sit at home for three months or six months while the restaurant was closed and they couldn't work, et cetera, that you've got to have some money sitting there to pay your bills just to tide you over till you can go back to work. Second of all, it's your retirement savings. Now, I'm not going to go in terms of this presentation into a lot of detail because it can get uh, quite complicated, but very high level in terms of your monthly salary that one earns, you can pay up to 27.5% of your taxable income as uh, into a retirement type fund. And the tax benefits for that that it, it saves you monthly tax paying into a retirement fund, and it's capped at a total amount of 350,000 Rand per year. So one, ideally in terms of your monthly uh, salary, you should ideally be trying to pay up to a maximum of 350,000 Rand a monthly amount into a retirement type product. And then lastly is your wealth creation side of it. There you can invest into things like property, your home, additional properties. The government also from about five years or so ago started what they called tax-free investments. That's available to everybody up to 36,000 Rand a year. And it's highly recommended that you should be doing that for you, your husband, your kids, etc. Uh, because it's, it's really a total and utter tax-free um, benefit that you should be taking advantage of. So those are the three broad areas 
throughout your life that we should be trying to, to save with. So what makes for a successful retirement? <clears throat> I think, first of all, you've got to be saving enough. And we're going to touch on some of these topics throughout the talk. You save enough for long enough with a, an appropriate, appropriate investment. You do need to just be aware of the costs of investing. And very, very importantly, is to stick to the plan and not get um, panicky or anxious when markets go up and down, as we know that they do. And very, again, high level, we generally define a successful retirement as one that gives you 70% of your final salary adjusted for inflation an income of that amount for at least the next 20 to 25 years, of course, until, well, until you die. So savings for retirement, that's ultimately your goal is to achieve a month, be able to have a monthly income equal to at least 70% of whatever your final salary was. How do you know if you're on track to achieve this? And I've put some very, very rough guidelines in, in place here is after 10 years of working, so let's assuming you start working at 25, let's say you are currently 35 years old, if you have saved about two times of your current annual salary, then you're on track. If you're now 45 years old, you should have your savings should be equal to about five times your current salary. So if you're earning 600,000 Rand a year, you should have at least 3 million Rand saved if you're 45 years old. At 30 years old, 10 times your salary, and when you hit retirement, 16 times your salary. So if those is that if your savings pie <clears throat> is roughly hitting those amounts of amounts, you know that you're roughly on track in terms of your retirement savings. I'm going to give you just two examples here. <clears throat> so this is an example of Mark. He started working at 25 years old, earning 250,000 Rand a year. And he contributed his 27% of his salary like he can, as I mentioned, in terms of your retirement savings. His salary increased at 5.5% a year. <clears throat> and every five or 10 years, he got a bit of an extra salary increase because he performed really well and got promoted, et cetera. So at, after 40 years of working, if you take that scenario, he was actually earning when he hit 65, 2.7 million Rand package or salary a year. And the outcome for him looked like this or would have looked like this. So the gray bars here show you his retirement savings. So you'll see by the time he hits 40, he's actually, his retirement savings are sitting at about 75 million Rand and he's retired with 29 times his final salary. So that's well in line with what he would be trying to do. And this person would be able to, to retire with great peace of mind. And the green line on this graph is really plotting you the minimum amounts that he would have needed to make, to save, to hit a, a healthy retirement. So somebody who started early, he stuck to the plan, put every month his, his savings aside, you very comfortably hit his retirement. But of course, that's not always the case and life isn't always that perfect. This example is Mark started working again at 25, earning the same salary to 250,000 Rand a year. But like a lot of people, he needed some cash and money to buy a car, to travel, to buy his house, save for education. So he couldn't afford to, from day one, invest his full 27% of his salary. He started at 12.5%. And he, he contributed 12% of his salary for four years. Then for the next four years, he contributed 15. Then the next four, 17, 20, et cetera. And only after 30 odd years did he hit the maximum 27% of his salary. He was able to do that because 
he had paid off some of his debts, etc. This is how he, he would have turned out. So luckily, again, he stuck to a plan. He was consistent. He would have retired with about 20 times his final salary at about 55 million rand in, in his savings. So you can see, first of all, there just the difference, 55 million versus 75 million difference. That's 20 million rand difference, nearly 50% of what of 55 million if you had just saved that 27 percent of your salary from day one and that talks to that power of compounding that i spoke to right at the beginning of the presentation so because the first person st started saving larger amounts earlier he was getting larger growth on growth for a longer period of time and that simply really was the, is the difference between 55 and 75 million. So that's, that's broadly speaking, I would say some of the broad concepts and uh, in terms of saving for retirement and what the, the concepts are and what ideally one should be trying to achieve. Um, the next question, I guess, is, well, how do you invest or where do you put your money? So when people say for retirement, they're really, you've got to invest into markets. And in terms of the asset classes or where you can invest your money, we can break it down into largely four broad asset classes. And this is, again, the same for any person in the, across the world, really. So you can invest into cash or money. Then we, you can invest into what we call bonds uh, or fixed income, you may have heard. Equities, which is another word for shares uh, or the stock market. And then property. And property, the two ways you can invest, I guess, into property. One is into bricks and mortar property, where you physically buy a house or a flat. And the other is into listed property. So those are also shares listed on the stock market. And uh, those are normally companies that manage things like the big shopping centers, the DNA Waterfront, Canal Walk, um, Santon Shopping Center, et cetera, and big office blocks. So these office blocks, these big shopping centers are owned by listed companies and you can actually own pieces of those properties. And then I've, you'll see I've got a South African and a and uh, the world there, you can invest into South African cash, South African bonds, South African listed equities and property stocks, as well as investing into global, which would be often US dollar denominated, but also euros or pounds, uh, cash, bonds, listed shares and listed property. To, to invest offshore, uh, one is able to take up to a million rand very easily with very low admin offshore per year. And you can actually take up to 10 million rand uh, if you apply to the Reserve Bank. So there are ways to take out quite a large portion of money into offshore as well. Now, the key thing to understand with these different asset classes is that they behave very differently over short and long run, over time, basically. And this talks to one's tolerance for risk. So what this graph over here is showing is bonds and cash, the two more conservative types of asset classes. And this is plotting it over the last 20 years or so. So the black line here is cash, uh, and it's showing you the rolling, what we call the rolling one-year return. So at any point in time, if you go and sort of look, so if we take March 2005 on the left, up to the black line, you'll see it gives you a number of about 8% or so. So that's what cash would have given you in March 2005 if you held it for one year. And roughly, you can see over the last 20 years, cash has given you fairly constant return of around about, you know, six to eight to 10% return. The blue line is bonds. 
That's the next step up in the risk spectrum. What you can see here is over any rolling one year period, again, the returns can differ. It goes up and down, but it's roughly between 20% in the best years. Some years you can see you've actually got below naught, but normally again, it's somewhere between naught and 20, gen generally above cash, but it does move up and down around about. The one thing that affects bonds the most is actually interest rates. And you know, if every three months or so, you often read in the newspaper, the Reserve Bank has announced they're keeping interest rates unchanged. Well, the Reserve Bank announced interest rates are going up and they're raising it by 50, half a percent, or interest rates have been going, are going down and they've lowered interest rates. When they move those interest rates, it's one of the effects on bonds and bonds either go up or go down, depending on whether they change those interest rates up or down. We then add equities onto here, which is now the green line. And that's the next step up in the risk spectrum. And one can see here that this green line is significantly more squiggly and volatile and up and down and all over the show than the blue and certainly the black. But equally importantly is that it has much greater highs. So you'll see there in about 2006, equities gave you 70% over a 12 month period. But likewise in March, 2008, 2009, during the global financial crisis, equities fell by 40, 50% over that 12 month period, but you'll see made a very, very quick recovery after that. And then again, on the right hand side, you'll see the fall now during COVID, but again, the extremely strong recovery that equities have made in the last 12 months or so. So holding equities is a much more bumpy ride, but the returns over the longer term are significantly higher than bonds and on cash. I thought this was quite a, a, a nice graph. Um, so it's just a cartoon, the guy listening to CNN or the stock market news, the stock market fell sharply today, then it bounced back, spiraled upwards, jumped forward, leapt to new heights, tumbled rapidly and took first place in the gymnastics competition. So really what that's talking about is what you've just seen on the graph before, where equities really are, are much more volatile. They go up and down and all over the show, and you've got to have the ability and the risk tolerance to be able to handle that. This really summarizes, I think, the other key, key point, which we've just spoken about. And this just plots you for the last 20 years, the cumulative effect of the different asset classes. So if you had invested 100 Rand on day one into each of those asset classes, how would they have grown? How would your money have grown over a 20 year period? And what you can see here, the, the very bottom line, the gray sort of line is inflation. Remember we said that your money needs to grow at least equal to inflation to keep your real wealth constant. So cash, which is the dark black line, does just keep up with inflation, as you can see. Um, so holding money just in your bank deposit or cash account just keeps you up with inflation. Bonds, as you can see, gives you a little bit extra. That's the green line. Equities has been the blue line. And then listed property has been the red line. So listed property for the first 10 years of two, you know, 2000 to 2010 was an extremely uh, strong asset class. And then it became quite volatile a little bit and had some big falls in the last five years or so. But over time that you can see here is that equities have given you a significantly higher return on your money than bonds and bonds have given you much better return than cash. So 
to grow one's money over, remember you are saving over a 20 to 40 year time horizon. You need to have equities and listed property in your mix and a degree of bonds and then a degree of cash. But holding your money, which many people do just in cash or in deposit on the bank, is one of the worst long-term investments because as you can see, your money grows nowhere near to the level that, that you require. Um, I'm not going to really go into this in too much detail, but this really just summarizes what I've just said is your defensive asset classes versus your growth asset classes. So that's what I've really just explained to you is cash, money market and bonds are really your defensive assets and equity and listed property are more your growth assets, but you can lose capital over the short term with these growth asset classes. This looks like quite a busy slide, but it's, it's just trying to show you a, a concept. And this again shows you for the last 12 years or so, what each of these asset classes have given you in terms of returns. And this is taking those bonds, equity, property, and cash for both local and offshore. Um, so if we just take, let's say as an example, 2012, you see there, South African property gave you 35% return in that year. Global property also gave you 35%. South African equity then gave you 26%, etc. all the way down to US dollar cash uh, and South African inflation around about 5%. If we then take, um, well, so the idea of this, chart is to just take those colors then and you'll see that listed property, South African property in 212 of 35, the next year gave you 8%, the next year 26, then 8, then 10, then 17, then minus 25, it was the worst performing asset class, etc. And you can follow the, the colors of each of the asset classes. And really the take out of this slide is that year to year to year, the different asset classes move all over the show. So it's impossible to try and be smart and pick that I only want to be in equities or I only want to be in property or I only want to be in bonds because it's impossible to predict the future. And really what you ideally want to be doing is spreading your risk across these various color bars so that in each year, you expose yourself to hopefully one of the blocks that is nearer the top. And yes, you will have some exposure to a block that is also nearer the bottom. So I think the key takeout points for this section is that different asset classes perform differently. So equities performs differently to bonds and differently to cash. The higher you go up the risk spectrum, you get higher growth over the longer term. So equities and property over the longer term. So we're talking 10 year plus investment time horizons have generally given you a return of at least inflation plus 6%. So much higher growth than bonds that have just beaten inflation by about 2% and holding money in cash has only beaten inflation by about 1%. But as you're holding these riskier assets, your chances of capital losses or losing money in the short term does increase. And as a result, you therefore need to diversify your risk by spreading across all of those asset classes. So that takes me to then the last part, which is how do I go about saving? So now we understand how we need to save for retirement. We need to start early, we need to be consistent. We need to invest into the markets across the various asset classes. But how do we now go about investing into these asset classes? So really the easiest way and the way in which the vast majority of people in South Africa and, and even across the world go is to invest into what are called unit you know, trust funds. 
There's currently about 3 trillion rand invested in the unit trust industry in South Africa. And what is a unit trust? It's really a pool of money from many different people. So you, get, you can have thousands of investors into a unit trust fund. They each invest their money. It goes into this pool of money that then gets invested into whether it be bonds or equities or cash or money market instruments that we've discussed. And then that whole pot gets divided into equal units and people own those units then of that pot. So that's broadly what a unit trust fund is. Um, again, I'm not going to go too much on onto this slide, just I think the key things of unit trusts is first of all, it's a highly regulated environment. It's monitored by the South African authorities, by the Reserve Bank, by what's called the Financial Services Control Authorities, which is like the regulators. The, it's the unit trusts are managed by professionals. Uh, they, they are flexible. They are generally pretty cost effective, et cetera. So just to have peace of mind that these are highly regulated um, types of entities. What are the, uh, again, I'm, I'm trying to keep it simple here. What are the, they, they are, they, we divide the unit trust industry into what we call unit trust categories. Uh, and there are multiple categories, but I've put in here the four main categories within which unit trusts fall within the South African market. The one is money market or cash type of unit trust funds. And then the, on the top right is equity funds. So we've spoken about equities. So these are unit trust funds that invest into South African stocks or offshore equities. And then we have what are, the, are largely the retirement focused unit trust funds, which another word for, for saving for retirement is, pruden is prudential. And there are rules around the unit trust funds that need to comply with the, the retirement saving regulations. And we have there a low, what's called the low risk and the high risk prudential type funds. The lower risk ones hold up to maximum 40% in equities and the higher risk ones hold up to 75% in equities, which is the limit actually for pension or retirement savings from an equity perspective. So it's really your low, your medium, your high medium, and then your equity risk profile within the unit trust space. Now, what have the returns that these unit trusts have given you over periods of time? So I've put in here, for each of those risk categories, the last three, five, 10, and 20 year returns for those unit trust categories. Now, the most important one for me is the right hand side one, the 20 year one. So remember, we are saving for retirement over the longer term. People are actually saving for 40 years. Now, the 40 year number looks similar to this 20 year number. And you'll see there that as we would have expected, the higher the risk category, your higher the return over the, long, over the longer time period. So your cash has given you about 7% return per year for the last 20 years. Your maximum 40% in equities pension type fund has given you 9% a year, 11 odd percent for your higher risk one, and 12, 13 to 14% for your pure equity type market returns. So you can see there by holding money in cash versus holding money in equities, you've nearly doubled your return per year for 20 years. And remember that compounding effect of growth on growth, that makes a massive difference. Over the shorter period of time, things move up and down as we've spoken about. Remember, we've said you have that volatility. You saw how those lines were more squiggly. And over different three different time periods, these different funds 
will give you differing returns. Uh, so over the shorter term in South Africa, actually, we've had quite volatile markets. We know we had the COVID fall last year, et cetera. So you can see actually over the last three years or so, uh, the numbers are, have, of, are quite similar across the various risk categories. The higher risk pension fund, 7.4%, has given you the best return for the last three years or so. So the relationship really is the more time that you have, the more capacity you have for risk, and the, hence the more return you can expect over time. And I think those numbers that we've just looked at really talk to that. The other um, really, really important point that I just wanted to make is invest when investing, and that was right in the very first slide that I spoke to as well, which is, can you stick to a plan and manage your emotions? And this is one of the biggest, biggest failures of people, and I see it literally every day in my work and career. Um, and that is people, and it's, and you can't help about it. It's, it's human nature and it's human emotion. And it's the whole area of what we call behavioral finance, which is how do people behave when under stress? And this is really a typical graph that we've, uh, I've put here about how people behave naturally when the markets are going up or down. So if you just talking about a, a share, for example, and take any share, Anglo-American, for example, if on the left-hand side, as the share price is going up, um, okay, we've seen market performance like this. I must, I must, the share is going up. I need to buy the share as it's going up. Wow, and the share price goes up. Wow, this is great. Then slowly markets start to go sideways a bit. Oh, markets have their ups and downs. Then the share price and the market start to fall. Oh, I can't get out now. I have lost already my money. I must just hold on. Then the markets keep falling and they get more and more nervous. Everybody's stressing. Uh, shit, I better get out here. My portfolio is worth so little now. I better cut my losses and just move into cash. They sell out of the investment. The share price falls a bit more. Oh, uh, yes, I did the right thing. I'm sitting in my cash. Then the share price starts going back up again. Uh, things are looking better, but I know the story. I'm not going to do anything. The share price keeps going up. Oh, sure, but I better buy the share again. They go and buy the share and, you know, the whole cycle repeats itself. So what you find is people tend to buy the shares often when they're expensive and they sell the shares um, when they're panicking and when the share price has fallen. And this is the exact opposite to, of course, what you're meant to be doing. You want to be buying the shares when they're cheap or investing into the markets when they're cheap and selling when they're expensive. And when are things at the cheapest? They're at the cheapest actually when fear and anxiety is at its highest. So when everybody else is selling and panicking and markets are falling is actually when you don't want to be doing that and when you want to be investing your money. Um, so to put everything really together in, in this table here, starting on the bottom is you want to set your investment time frame based on what your objectives are. And we've spoken about, you can have different objectives. It can be in the short term to save, to buy a car, medium term to buy a house, longer term paying off the house, long, uh, school education, and of course, saving for retirement is a 20, 30 year type of time horizon. So you have your investment time horizon on the bottom part there. On the, step number two is the, your risk appetite. And as we've said, the longer your investment time horizon, you can hold more risk. So you would move on the left axis there, higher up the curve. And so depending on your time horizon and your appetite for risk should then guide you into whether you should be going more on the left-hand side into cash, money market, bonds, the lower risk type of investments, or as you go up the risk spectrum, 
your time horizon is longer, you can handle more capital losses or volatility over the markets over time, then you can go more into the higher risk type of areas and equity exposures. So I've got two more slides and then we're done. This just shows you a, a lower equity type of uh, fund like the one we looked at earlier, uh, which I said was capped at 40% equities. And importantly, what this what we've done here is looked at really a hundred, the last hundred years. And we've said, if you have got at retirement now, your money that you've saved, your pot, and you need this pot to, to, to last 30 years from 65 to 95, has it managed to do that? So uh, each sort of green line here is a particular year. So if I just uh, look at, um, choose a period here, 1953 in the middle of the slide, in 1953, your, your savings pot would have lasted your 30 years. That's the line that's going across the page is at the 30 year mark. That is how long you needed your retirement pot to last for. And in 1953, your retirement pot investing in a, in a low equity fund would have lasted, just made it the 30 years. You would have gone between 1935 and 1953, your pots would have lasted much less. You can see on average, probably about 25 years or so. Um, and in 1975 to 1980, your money would have lasted well over 40 years. So uh, your, your return would have averaged about 9% a year. And as we're saying, on average over this whole 100 year period, your money would have lasted by, for about 25 years, which actually is less than the 30 years that you needed it to last. So you missed your, your target in these red areas here. Um, if we take this now and you rather had invested into the 75% equity fund, this is exactly the same exercise, but how it would have looked. And what you can see here is the periods of where your money did not meet your 30 year retirement uh, objective is much less. So there's most of the, the periods of time you missed your targets here on in the 1930s for a period post the Second World War, and then a little bit in the great in, in the depressions, et cetera, of the late 1960s. But otherwise, your money had made it. And here, and this was purely because your return was now 11% a year and not the 9% because you had a greater degree of risk appetite. So what's really important to summarize then, I think the key takeout points is that the earlier you start to save, the better. Uh, this power of compounding must not be underestimated and it makes a massive, massive difference on what your savings pot at the end of the day lands up being. So really, if there's one thing you can encourage your children when you have, if you've got your children and they're leaving school and starting to work is for them to start saving for retirement in their 20s because it's going to make a massive difference on their ultimate pot when they hit 65. You need to grow your money at least equal to inflation. You need to make use of the tax allowances that the regulation and legislation allows you. So up to 27% of your salary, you should be investing into a retirement fund up to this maximum of 350,000 a year. And without doubt, what you have to be doing is taking advantage of the 36,000 rand per annum tax-free investments that were started about five years or so ago. Um, keep it simple, look at your investment time frame. look at your tolerance for risk, as that ultimately will affect the return. Diversify across those asset classes, 
across equities, across bonds, across cash, domestically, as well as investing globally. Um, you need to have the sufficient risk in your portfolios. And we've spoken about that. People often just hold their money in cash because they think it's the safest and it's what they feel the most comfortable with. But cash is actually the silent killer on your investments. You, you need to hold risk in your portfolios as shown in those last two graphs. The difference between a low risk and a high risk portfolio can make a very big difference. Unit trusts, they're definitely not the only way to invest, but they certainly are one of the most accepted ways and one of the easiest ways. Just be aware of the costs of unit trust investing. Costs do eat away at returns. Manage your emotions, that's vital. You have to have to stick to the plan. Remember that emotional graph, do not panic when everybody else is panicking, stick to the plan. In, in fact, often when everybody else is panicking, if you have extra money, be going against the tide and that's when you need to be adding to your, to your savings pot. And then lastly, if you take everything that we've really spoken about, um, I encourage you to go and speak to a financial advisor. Uh, generally, they are really good guys out there. They can make sure that you are on course or on track for your savings, that you're invested in the appropriate funds and taking advantage of all the various tax benefits, et cetera. Don't try and do it on your own. So that's it. Um, Lisa, I'm going to hand back to you and if there are any questions. I know we only got well, a little bit of time if we want to cut off after an hour. Thanks, Trevor. Um, do you want to just stop? Oh, there we go. Wow, what an incredible um, thorough overview of, of the subject. Um, you really gave a uh, a clear understanding on, on, on this matter. So thank you, thank you for sharing this, this with us and um, for your time. We are out of time. So I am very mindful of that and sticking to, to the 9.30. If there is one quick question um, that someone wants to ask. Oh, Dean, you're on mute before we close off. Uh, hi, thanks, uh, Trevor. <clears throat> Great presentation. Thanks very much. Um, the question I have is, is there's always this um, balance between investing a significant amount of money in um, retirement and then also taking out your insurance against death and disability. And a lot of um, policies are coming out where if you upfront load payments now, by the time you get to 60, that kind of comes down and your monthly payment for that kind of risk and in insurance, um, that payment will come down a lot. Now, my feeling is, yes, when you're in your 20s, your 30s, and your 40s, you need more insurance in case something happens to you to pay off your debts at the moment, school for the kids, university, making sure your spouse is, is sufficiently covered for, in the, God forbid, in the event that you, you die and you aren't around. But by the time you hit 50, 55, 60, generally your kids are out of school, they, they're self-sufficient, most of your overhead comes down, you probably don't need, let's say, 10 or 15 million death cover, let's say, when you're 40, um, at 55, you probably would need half of that, so where's that kind of balance where I'd rather pay less on buying insurance, which I get no yeah. return on, and start to increase the investment for the retirement? Yeah. Your thoughts? Thanks, Dean. Yeah, good question, and it's one uh i think many people play with and I, I think you've summarized it actually very well and you on your thought process is on the right track so i think where most people go wrong is that they don't review the insurance and your i think that's your point and i think it's totally right is that you do you need to review your insurances that you have particularly as you're getting older and your your point is totally spot on as you're getting older, you need that insurance less, um, generally. 
uh, so of course, like you're saying, when your kids are out of school and paid for their university, you don't need that sort of um, student cover. When you when you have built up your retirement pot, so that and your house bond has been paid off, you don't need that cover. Um, you know, the as much life cover as what you may have had because you don't your your bond is paid off and your retirement pot is there sufficiently. So I totally agree with you that as you get older, you should be reducing your life cover and, and several of those insurance policies. And rather with that money that you save, you can just add it to your, to your savings. Um, rather save that, let it grow for you. And yeah, and you have, you, have, you have the ability to access that money as well, if and when you need. So in short, I think insurance is extremely important, but I'm also agreeing with you as you're getting older, the needs for certain insurances definitely becomes less. And I think many people forget to reduce it. Uh, and many people, yeah, often then over-insure themselves. Uh, things like the disability cover, sick cover, medical aid type things, the opposite often. There you need to make sure that you have that in your old age, that you have good medical cover, that you have good, um, I'm not an insurance expert at all, but I think it's like called the dread disease and all those types of things. Those you want to make sure you have them, that they're in place and that they cover you, the gap, gap cover, it's called, which pays for your medical bills over and above for what you insured. So there it's the opposite. There you want to make sure you've got really good medical cover, sick cover, but on the life cover, house cover, reduce. Trevor, there's one question in the chat box, if you can really yeah. um, answer it like in, in 30 seconds. Um, Re-retirement savings, is there any reason not to use a retirement annuity and rather use another tool? E.g. if one is below the tax threshold in the gig economy, etc. In the gig economy? So in other words, um, using another thing instead of a retirement annuity, is there something yeah. else that you could? Um, yeah, so just maybe... Uh, I mean, I think I understand the question, but I'll hopefully answer it in this. Um, I think, and I did chat to it and it talks to a little bit sticking to the plan. The one very, very common mistake that many people make, and it does depend on one's social strata, circumstances, et cetera, is people who often work, say this, you start working at 25, at 35, you get retrenched or you leave your job. Some people, you know, they get divorced, whatever it might be. And they, when they leave their job and they've been paying into a retirement fund, you have, you've got two options. You can, some people, you can actually cash in your savings or you have to put it in what's called a preservation fund, which as the name says, preserves it and it can still let it grow until you hit retirement age. Now, what you want to do is without doubt, make sure you put it in a preservation fund and preserve it and make sure it keeps on growing. But lots and lots of people go and cash it in, use that money to go pay off their car or go on a holiday in between jobs or whatever it might be. And then when they get their new job, they start again saving you know, into a pension fund in that new job. But what they've gone and done is lost out now on that first 10 years of savings that they've done because they've gone and paid off their car and spent it. And the main thing that where it has a massive impact is of course that they're missing out on that compound growth for the next 25 years on that pot that they've gone and cashed in. And it makes a massive difference on your ultimate savings at the end of retirement. So really, really, I discourage anybody to cash in pension savings during their working career. You need to try and preserve it. Now, on that question, 
you can you when people are saving you can you save either into a pension fund which is if you work in a large company every month they take a portion of your salary and they pay it into the pension fund that's one way you can't avoid that and it's a good thing that you you have to do that another way is for people who are often self-employed own their own businesses or even who work in a bigger company but they want to save an additional amount they take out what's called a retirement annuity or, or an ra which is what you're asking uh, and that is where you can set the amount that you want to save every month. So again, ideally, the larger the amount you can afford, the better. So, so the benefit to an RA is you get it's it, you you reduce your monthly tax because the amount that you pay into an RA is deductible off your taxable income. So that's why it's always good to do that RA. But once you've used that up, if that's the right word, you're over that 350,000 and you still want to do more, then it will be then you, what we call discretionary savings. And you can go and just invest it into unit trusts, into shares, take the money offshore, and yes, invest it ultimately for your retirement, but it's not in a retirement fund it's in just your own personal savings account and that would be what we were calling that wealth creation in that uh, picture right at the beginning so yes you can save for retirement outside of an RA just in your own personal name um, into unit trusts into shares locally and offshore and again very straightforward Thank you, Trevor. Thank you for a thorough, clear, making it clearer for us to understand and a really an outstanding presentation. So I thank you for your time you, and your support yeah. and your commitment to Orjet and for everyone else for, for joining us. And if you do have further questions, email them to me and I'll forward them to Trevor and we'll reply to you. Thanks, everybody. Keep safe and see you at the next one. Thank you. Cheers, everybody. Bye. Thank